Every time you sit down at a computer, you kind of have to trust that it's going to do what you expect. Whether it's that you type your email and you trust that it's only going to go to the person you as the addressee, or whether it's you're receiving your bank statement and you trust that what you see on the screen is really what the bank knows about your, your, your transactions and your current balance. And um, in order to do that, you have to rely on a vast number of components, both in your own computer and in the, in the network and in the servers at the other side of the network. And one thing that we've, we know goes wrong is that computers catch viruses. Computers have people breaking into them electronically and changing the way that they behave. So this, this field of trusted computing has developed, which is trying to think about how to make the design be changed in such a way that that can't take place. The internet to date has been built largely in a rather trusting way. Um, in its origins in the late 60s and 70s and then 80s, it was mainly uh, an academic research facility. It wasn't until the 90s that it really took off outside academia. Recent internet-inspired development at ARPA is the Enterprise Room. That's Enterprise as in Starship Enterprise. There have been a lot of efforts since then to develop more um, secure communications protocols to improve the reliability and security of operating systems and other kinds of software, but I think we still have a long way to go to build a trustworthy, resilient internet um, that fully reflects that dependence that's now being placed on it by society. We know for sure that every citizen of cyberspace, which is basically all of us to varying degrees, um, and in the near future will be all of us, has a role to play. Any point of access into cyberspace is, pot is potentially a point of attack, but we have a challenge because of the complexity of the message, and not just the complexity of the message, but the complexity of what we're going to ask people to do. It's not going to be as simple as put your seatbelt on when you're in the car. In the past, we've tended to keep most of our data and our documents and all the things that matter to us on a hard disk, on our own computer, or perhaps on a server that's on our local network within the building where we're working or something of that sort. That's turned out to be not as efficient as having a whole lot of computers somewhere else. Thanks to today's supercomputers, like this crane. We can share those servers when some people are asleep, other people are working, uh, and all those things. So the, the cloud can actually be a very green um, approach to computing. But the downside is, if I've got particular data that I value for myself, or if I'm processing somebody's private data, and I've got a, a, a strong legal obligation to process it carefully and fairly and safely, um, it's much harder for me to know whether that's actually happening. If it's on some server in the cloud, and there may actually be a copy of it in Ireland and in San Francisco, when I've got no further use for it, I still have no guarantee that when I press delete, it will actually get deleted. It may persist forever, because somebody else may find it useful, or they may carelessly fail to delete it when I ask them to. I need to protect my data, my processing, my resources from the other users of the same cloud resource. I'm actually sharing that server with another company who might be my competitor. I need to be fairly sure that my competitor doesn't get my data. And so I somehow need the server to be good enough to make sure that doesn't happen. Alongside that, you need lots of other pieces for the trust story. You need, you need to know who the who the service provider is and what kind of policies they have around staff behavior and server management and who gets access to the room where all the servers are and all sorts of other things. But all of those things sit in the background compared to making sure that you've actually got the right software running. Society and policymakers do have um, an option here. You often hear people say, privacy is dead, uh, privacy is a 20th century uh, conceit, it was nice while we have it, but surely with all of these new big data technologies, 
you just can't protect privacy. Actually, that's not true. There's been a lot of very interesting computer science research uh, over the last 30 years into ways that you can protect information, you can encrypt information so it can only be decrypted by the authorised users, that you can build all kinds of complex information systems around things like smart power grids, um, intelligent vehicles, uh, smart cities in a way that will let you get the economic and social benefits of those technologies but at the same time will limit the access that people that aren't authorised to look at personal data can have. The idea behind the T-Clouds project was to do this, this work of making sure that the, that the software running on our server in the cloud uh, is exactly the software that I wanted and in fact only releasing the data that might be quite personal or commercially sensitive uh, when I've got a guarantee that it's actually running the right software. It's a two-way authentication, so what you'll all be familiar with at the moment is if you do online banking, you go in, you authenticate yourself to the bank, the bank doesn't really do the same to you. Um, so we have a bunch of technologies designed here in Oxford that solve that two-way, that piece. Sometimes it depresses me to think that I, I, I think about a problem in, in computer operating systems and then I go and visit colleagues at Microsoft who've got a thousand people thinking about that problem and I wonder what progress I can make. And yet, they find value in talking to us because we can do some good work on theory and we can also innovate in ways that they can't because they're constrained by a, by a corporate context. We're doing what you would expect in terms of the computer science piece on cyber detection, but we're working with psychologists to better understand how we might input human behavioural uh, aspects into that system, but we're also working very closely with the business school so we can understand whilst we're designing the technologies that might sense these attacks, at the same time we can consider the potential for operational disruption in an enterprise and build the awareness campaigns that we would need to deliver to the executive boards and the staff of that enterprise to help them to adopt our ideas. Can we visualise what's happening in cyberspace in a way that's much more intuitive to a human, that would enable a human to spot something that doesn't quite fit, that looks wrong, and then raise an alert? One of the things we've been working on in the visual analytics space is enabling the technical staff who get given these alerts to connect this with the priorities of an enterprise, the tasks that are being undertaken today, so that I can get this aircraft in the air, are we doing a mergers and acquisition, and we can connect and predict the impact or the consequences of these potential attacks, because these alerts are not always correct. You have to determine which 10 of these 300, 3,000, 3 million you should really take action on. This is how we predict the consequence would be for you, and the idea is that the analyst can very quickly say, of all of these millions of alerts, I just need to go fix this one box over here first and everything keeps going in the organisation. So there's, there's very much a, a two-way flow of both information and expertise and ideas about things that are worth trying and um, I wouldn't have it any other way. We have a lot of evidence from the last almost 50 years now in how data protection and privacy laws have developed that that kind of approach, well, we're just going to try and sweep up everything and then have rules behind the scenes about when uh, government agencies or when companies can access that data, that that kind of approach doesn't work very effectively. Of course, intelligence agencies are monitoring what's going on on the internet. That's, that's not news. The Snowden leaks have given us a much better understanding of the scale of what's going on. So the fact that some of the figures are quite startling, for example, that the US National Security Agency is collecting five billion location updates every day from global mobile phone networks that are applying then sophisticated data analysis tools to all of that data. So to work out, for example, patterns of association between people 
which people are spending time with each other, which people are traveling together. Uh, even in some cases, it turns out, the NSA and CIA were able to warn their own agents if they could see that an, an agent's pattern of movements with their mobile phone was being mirrored by someone else. In other words, they were then under them, themselves under observation. People all over the world are realizing that these programs don't make us more safe. They hurt our economy, they hurt our country, they limit our ability to speak and think and live and be creative. Um, some of the things that the intelligence agencies have been doing uh, were a surprise, uh, particularly in terms of weakening encryption standards, which um, are really important for protecting people's personal data right across the internet economy and in government agencies, including in sensitive areas like in e-health, for example. So I think that, that has been a surprise because it does seem rather um, un unstrategic thinking. That's something the companies were very unhappy about because they think it will damage trust of their customers around the world in these American businesses. So I think that's one very interesting area to come out of this. How far will this change the, the structure of the global internet economy? And that finally leaves you with national or regional isolation, if you like, or the balkanization of the internet you often hear about, um, where uh, to a greater or lesser extent, businesses have to build national services that comply with national laws. Uh, we've seen a debate in the Brazilian parliament about a law that would, that would introduce these requirements, that would say if an American company wants to offer services to Brazilians, they would have to build servers in Brazil and physically store the data of Brazilians in Brazil. Um, internet companies are very concerned about that kind of legislation because it would significantly increase their costs. They would have to build national servers in countries around, around the world, potentially nearly 200 UN countries, for example. But I think if we're going to avoid that balkanization, we need to see some movement at the international agreement level, particularly by the United States. Certainly, um, since I started researching this area in the 90s, uh, the internet is much more mainstream that you'll get front page news about issues related to the internet these days, whereas 15 years ago it would have been relegated to the technology pages at the back of the newspaper. Um, I think that's a very positive thing. It means the broader population is aware of the importance of some of these issues, uh, but also politically it's important because it means policymakers themselves are aware of the issues, but also they know that their voters care about them. So they know that it might ultimately um, be a reason that their constituents might vote for or against them, how they reacted to things like uh, the Snowden revelations. If you look to date, there has been, uh, I think, not nearly enough recognition by states uh, about how important this issue is in the long term and even if it will be expensive to build much more secure systems that I think that's something that we need to be planning for in the longer term. Um, I hope that it doesn't take a disaster to uh, cause governments to change those positions. That is unfortunately of course often what it does. Uh, so with, with Chernobyl uh, or with the, the more recent nuclear disaster in Japan, for example, of course causes governments to pay much more attention to nuclear safety. I hope we don't have to see that kind of thing uh, in terms of cyber security. And the debates around how we're going to deal with the challenges in the next 10 years, feeding the world's population, dealing with unpredictable climate, dealing with mass movement of peoples around the world, all of these challenges when you hear the ideas that people are having to solve them and to match them, they're all dependent on cyberspace. And so it's quite clear it's not going anywhere, we're not switching it off. So to my mind, it's another environment. It's like the natural world. We have to worry about it and we have to make sure it's there for generations to follow us.